Welcome to the Perp Web Podcast, hosted by Joe Bosch. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Perp Web 98, day three, two, day two. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wishful, <laughs> Wishful thinking. He said, oh, yeah, that's true. Anyway, um, uh, before I get started, let's go ahead with the opening remarks. Reach out to us. Contact at perfuseneducation.com. You can see it right there. Um, you want to ask a question, you want to be a part of the panel, you want to give a lecture, whatever it is, you know, reach us there. If you want to call in today, which I would really appreciate, because if you haven't noticed, I'm your lecturer today, not Vicki Carlisle, who was originally scheduled by my partner in crime, who's not sitting here. Um, 832-239-5358. That's 832-239-5358. You want to call in, talk with me, uh, have some discussions. Happy to, uh, would love to hear that phone ring. We get so excited over here when that phone rings. You have no idea. Okay. Next up is our uh, scroll bar. That's on during the entirety of the program. So you can see our various different social media uh, sites, our call-in number, our emails, the whole thing. Please, if you would like, subscribe, share, do all that stuff uh, would be most appreciated by me. Um, our MediWeb uh, uh, clinical care app for perfusion uh, or for, for perfusionists, uh, which is also very appropriate for ECMO specialists, very appropriate for nurses. It's got some really neat sections. You've got the perfusion section, which is dedicated to just that while you're doing a case. You want to know what your DO2I is. You plug the numbers in and it gives it to you. You want to know um, what your SVR is. It gives it to you. You do the perfusion quick calcs. You put in your information. It'll give you your predicted crit uh, on your diluted uh, dilutional predicted crit on bypass. If you're wrapping, you add that in there too. Uh, give you your flows, all the various indexes, I think from 1.6 to maybe 3.2. I can't remember exactly, but you have everything you need, your heparin dose, your, pro your predicted protamine dose, all of that stuff there. Take a look. You see it all right there scrolling along. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You can go on Google Play or you can go to the App Store and find it. Then we have our PerfWeb podcast. Um, and uh, you can find that on whatever your favorite podcast streaming software is. And uh, you can listen to us as opposed to watching. Uh, if you're driving in the car uh, and you, uh, instead of listening to music, you want to listen to me, listen to one of the other folks that come here, uh, Vicki Carlisle, she's, but she's really great. Uh, Thomas, uh, uh, anybody else that has uh, Dr. Patel who's going to be here tomorrow talking about uh, some really interesting topic, and that is imaging and how can we as perfusionists better understand when they're looking at the echo, what are they talking about? When they're looking at a CT, what are they talking about? When you're looking at an X-ray in the ICU, how can you identify if the cannulas are in the right place? How can you determine whether or not the impella is in the right place? I mean, just a whole lot of different things. So pretty cool stuff going to happen tomorrow. I'll talk more about that later, but our podcast, there it is. Uh, and then we have our ECMO course, which I hope, I'm sorry, I threw that in there. Um, our ECMO course, I, I really would like it if you take a look at this. Now, I have to be very careful with what I say. The board has become very strict when it comes to uh, what we can or cannot say. So right now, it is not approved for Category 1 CEU for perfusion. It is, however currently approved for category one AMA PRA category one CME through, I believe, Oakstone. And uh, it's also approved for uh, category one CE for nursing. So mid-levels or what they now call uh, advanced practice providers, APPs, uh, physicians, nursing, um, all approved. And uh, just check back for any further approvals uh, or accreditations uh, by the ABCP. We'll just have to wait until we get that notification. But it's a super good course. Um, I'm very proud of it. 
Uh, you have two full days of didactic. It's long. It's a lot of information. Really great speakers. Uh, the faculty is second to none. You can find it at mediweb.us, uh, uh, Adult ECMO Specialist Course, and see uh, our faculty. Sometimes it varies and changes, but we've got people that really know what they're doing and what they're talking about. And our last course was great, but then it's followed up by two days of simulation. Now you can do the full course or you can just do the, uh, the two day didactic only uh, and uh, hopefully be able to get credits for those. But you can do the full course. Classes fill up quickly. It's limited to, I believe we're doing 16 uh, maximum students. Uh, but the full course does require uh, travel to uh, uh, the Woodlands, Texas, which is north of Houston. Uh, our simulation session is done at a beautiful conference center at uh, Memorial Hermann, the Woodlands Medical Center or hospital. And uh, it's really impressive. And it's an excellent uh, simulation. I mean, you cover every single thing and really help your skills. So if you're looking at doing ECMO, you're doing ECMO on rare occasion, maybe just post cardiotomy. I'm going to be talking about that a lot today, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, this is a really good course for anybody, a seasoned perfusionist, a new perfusionist, a perfusionist who's never done ECMO, a perfusionist that does ECMO now and again. Um, it would be an excellent course for the team as well. So please take a look at it. I would appreciate that. And uh, uh, we'll be opening. Uh, registrations are currently open for no, they're not. They're, a registration is not yet open. I'm sorry. I want to make sure I get this right. But it certainly will be in the it, very soon. Uh, but you can mark your calendar if that's what you if would like to do. Okay, next. Um, okay, that's the end of my remarks. Very good. The opening remarks are over with. And now we can get to the subject at hand. Oh, Vicky's here? Yeah, sure. Put her on. Hey, Vicky Carlisle. Oh, my God. Thank God you're here. How are you? Uh, oh, you're muted. You you have to unmute yourself. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. How are awesome. you? I'm good. I'm good. So good to see you. Um, I appreciate it. Well, I'm going to try to do this subject of yours um, justice. I don't know how. I think I think I feel pretty good. I think I'm going to do a good job, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay. So uh, awesome. so. So any, any, any words of wisdom to impart? <laughs> no, nothing. Anything yet. about the, anything about the ECMO course that we just completed? Uh, no, I think you did a good job saying it all. It's a real good course. Uh, and uh, like to see people there. Very good. Excellent. Okay. And we can also, um, since you're here, we do have the ability to package it up. And actually take it to a facility, right? We could take everything, we do. all the, every, uh, yeah. So we can do that as well. In case you want, if you don't want to send your team to Texas, we can come to your team. Yes. And, but the didactic would be virtual because that is virtual all the time. And that gives it more that, you know, being able to have additional, have the faculty live where you can ask them questions and things like that. I think that's a very important distinction. Yeah, and I think the the big benefit is to have the simulation part on facility. Yes. Uh, the hands-on part. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I, I agree with you hundred percent. I think I think this I'm very proud of the simulation that you have put together. Uh everyone who goes through your course, whether they be nursing or whether critical care nurses or they be uh mid levels. Or, the, or I guess they call them APPs. I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep saying mid-levels, but that's just what I'm used to. Um, or uh, perfusionists are very, very, very satisfied uh, and have uh, really given you rave reviews on the simulation portion of the uh, program. So you should be yes. very proud of that. I'm proud. I am proud of you. I hope so. I hope so. My, my goal is to get everybody happy and comfortable touching the circuit and, and uh, confident and knowing what they're doing. Yeah, and you I only think do that by getting in there and doing it. No, you're 100 percent right. And you listen to two days of this didactic training, all of this information. And at the end of the day, when you do the simulation and you're able to take a, touch this machine that tends to be stuck in a room where it's like, up, oh, don't go near that, you know, just stay away from that, where it takes a lot sure. of the mystery of that away and it ties together so much of what people have learned 
in the didactic portion and it makes it understandable now because you have this physical device to actually do it with. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think Very nurses good. traditionally are kind of taught not to go near it. So it's really a, really a good thing. They have to, they have to get in there and do it. Yes. Yeah. Which I don't understand that philosophy. I don't think that's a good philosophy. I think you know what my philosophy is. And that is that we should not be in silos. We should all understand each other's uh, uh, responsibilities to some degree so that um, you're able to uh, you're able to help each other, uh, because at the end of the day, it is a team sport. It is this this does require more yes. than just one person. Hey, there's your daughter. Is that? Here's I Abby. see her. Hey, on camera, Abby. Sorry. Abby's on camera. She All right. Very good. All right. Okay. Let me go ahead and get started. See how this works. I hope it works good. And uh, we'll uh, let me know and we'll go for, we'll start. Okay, complications of ECLS extracorporeal life support. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I guess, I guess you have to click that in order to do that. There you go. So here is my hypothetical question, all right? And anyone is welcome to answer this uh, that would like to. What would happen if we took a perfectly healthy adult, cannulated them either veno-arterial or veno-venous, and initiated ECMO. I won't leave you hanging. <laughs> yes, nothing good can come of this. On its own, ECMO is not good for us for a whole variety of reasons. We're gonna talk quite a bit about the what it does positively, but what it also does negatively. And we have to be aware of these, uh, these, these morbidities associated with it um, so that we can, these derangements that occur, so that we can better manage those so that we can accomplish the goals we want with it while reducing or mitigating to the best of our ability the deleterious effects that the system itself has. So let's take a moment, if we can, and talk about the indications for ECMO. So you have VA ECMO, which is when you have a need for circulatory support, and you have the V ECMO or venovenous need when you have a need for respiratory support only because you have preserved cardiac function. That's really the distinction because you can use VA ECMO for respiratory failure, but you cannot use VV ECMO for circulatory failure. So the kind of distinction there is VA ECMO is when you need circulatory and or circulatory slash pulmonary support. VV ECMO when you only need respiratory support. And this is when the ability to maintain circulation or oxygenation and ventilation, CO2 clearance, through other less invasive measures is deemed unlikely to adequately benefit the patient, whether that be the invasive uh, 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 ventilation, uh, so intubation, mechanical ventilation, nitrous oxide, flow land, uh, pressors, inotropes, Primacore, we go on and on and on down the list. Um, but, you know, what I have found, and I think that the data is very, uh, I think the data is conclusive, that earlier intervention is better. You will have better outcomes. But what is too early? And if you do it early, and I've, I recently was on a case that, that, that was very early, uh, you know what, I, this patient's not coming off bypass. Let's just go straight to ECMO, VA ECMO. And the patient had a four or five day run, weaned off ECMO, did great. That's not too terribly long ago that that happened. It was just a very quick decision. We're just going to do this. This is how we're going to do it. We stayed centrally cannulated and it really worked out pretty well. But the criticism will always be that patient could have gotten through without ECMO. So, so too early. They didn't need it. Too late, 
it never works. So peep, the, 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 the naysayers are up, oh, ECMO never works. No one ever survives ECMO. Well, if you wait too late, um, that, is definitely the, that, that, that is definitely the case. And where that ideal location, Goldilocks zone, whatever you want to call it, is, is uh, dependent. It is absolutely patient dependent, situation dependent on any given day. The same patient can have a different presentation that makes it appropriate today, but it wasn't yesterday and it may not be tomorrow. So it's very difficult to find that ideal place to say we need to do this. But clearly, early is better. I don't think there's any question about that. This is a very important aspect to my presentation today, and that is biocompatibility and biostability. So biocompatibility is how the material affects the body. Um, so we try to use biocompatible coatings and different kinds of materials to make these things to somewhat disguise the material from the body. Biostability, on the other hand, is how the body affects affects the material. And a perfect example of that is using a short-term oxygenator, which we find in uh, our standard cardiopulmonary bypass cases where the uh, hollow fibers are made of polypropylene. And over time, and not a long time, they're usually only rated for six hours. Now, even the long-term oxygenators are rated for six hours, but I'll get into that in a minute. That has to do with approval through the FDA. In real terms, um, the polypropylene fibers are very reactive to lipids, whether it be the patient's lipids or whether it be infused lipids vis-a-vis -vis propofol uh, as a sedative. So you have to take that into consideration. The polymethylpentene or PMP fibers, which is what the Quadrox is made of, what the EOS is made of, um, is a fiber a material that is not reactive. So that is biostability. That's the difference when I talk about biocompatibility and biostability. You will see this slide a couple of times. It's an important slide. ECLS helps to facilitate lung protective ventilation, reduces pro-inflammatory cytokines because you don't have that stress going on, decreased ventilator-induced lung injury or villi, myocardial rest and hemodynamic improvement in the case of circulatory support, Improvement in organ perfusion, the heart is failing, you need circulation, you're giving circulation, that's going to help all of the end organs. And all of these things tend to decrease the systemic inflammatory response. On the other hand, ECLS on its own can result in visceral ischemia and reperfusion injury, which results in reactive oxygen species, we've all heard of, of, of that. And which results in end organ dysfunction, bacterial component translocation, which ends up uh, resulting in endotoxemia. And these things left unchecked, unchecked result in cell dysfunction, activation of complement, coagulation, leukocytes and platelets, dysregulation of the inflammatory uh, mediators, which they just start to pile up and pile up and cause all kinds of other issues we're going to get into a little more deeply. And this cycle perpetuates and it gets worse and worse, and it results in an increase in systemic inflammation. So you may have a situation where you have a patient that goes on ECMO, they are uh, in severe ARDS, they're, they've been hypoxic, they're on max ventilator settings, their lungs are just getting beaten up, they're on high inspired oxygen, they're hemodynamically unstable due to the hypoxemia, they're getting sicker and hy tissue hypoxia of the heart, for example, they're getting sicker and sicker and they're just circling the drain and that creates a tremendous stress reaction, this systemic inflammatory response syndrome that occurs. We put them on ECMO and we sort of stabilize this, but then this happens over here. 
and you have your honeymoon phase. You get on ECMO and everything looks great and everybody just, oh, everything is fantastic. And several days later, they're bleeding out of their mouth. They're bleeding out of their nose. They have a GI bleed. Their bilirubin starts going up. Their urine output starts going down. All of these things start happening. And why is that happening? Look, we've got them oxygenated. Everything is going so great. What is going on? Well, it's what's going on is this. ECLS in it on its own is deleterious to us, whether it be cardiopulmonary bypass for heart surgery or whether it be ECMO, it doesn't make any difference. ECLS on its own is not good for us. It helps to manage failure of your circulatory system, your heart, or your lungs, or both. Any comments on that, Vic? No, I think that was perfectly put. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. So you break these complications down with either, so we're going to separate it out. On the left side of your screen, you see VA ECMO, veno arterial ECMO. On the right side, you see VV ECMO, and then you have below the common things. So it's kind of like the uh, coagulation cascade. You have your intrinsic, your extrinsic, and then you meet at 10A and you're uh, at factor 10 where your common pathway is. So in this case, it's VA complications, VV complications, and common ca ca complications. So First in the VA, you have lower limb ischemia. Well, you're not gonna you, you you're not gonna get that with VV ECMO. Lower limb thrombosis, major arterial bleeding. If you're centrally cannulated and you tried to close the chest, or even if you used uh, a wound vac or something like that, tamponade is not that uncommon. If you have VA ECMO with peripheral cannulation, meaning fem fem. Uh, then you have a you are at risk. Anytime you have VA ECMO with peripheral cannulation, you are at risk of Harlequin syndrome or North South syndrome or dual circulation or whatever you choose to call it. And then you also have the all undesired uh, left ventricular distension problem. Uh, in the VV ECMO side, you have to be concerned about research circulation catheter malposition for your single uh, dual lumen catheters, uh, right, uh, uh, right ventricular and atrial uh, dilatation with hepatic congestion, refractory hypoxemia, pneumothoraces, cerebral uh, drainage obstruction. So in other words, you put an Avalon, this is one of the things I'm hearing now is when you put an Avalon in, you may not be draining your right IJ uh, from the brain, and that can cause increased uh, 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 back pressure to your uh, cerebral drainage. And it makes me ponder whether we should not be using cerebral oximetry on all of these cases to guard against that. But nevertheless, that is a potential problem and can cause uh, uh, issues with brain perfusion. So we have to be very concerned about that. In the common section, you have, of course, cannula malposition. That can happen in VA or VV. Now, it's I put it separate in the VV for obvious reasons. We're talking about a single cannula technique. Bleeding is common. Thrombosis is common. Infection is common. Systems failing is common. Air in the circuit is common. Not that it happens commonly, but it's common to both. I want to make sure I'm clear on that. AKI and acute renal failure, acute kidney injury, acute renal failure, intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, and, I, you know, we saw intracranial hemorrhages even when we were using no anticoagulation. So there's, and I think the data, the, 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 the studies that exist now are really showing that ECLS alone increases your risk from, of intracranial hemorrhage with with uh, notwithstanding your anticoagulation strategy, neurologic, non-specific neurologic uh, uh, complications that come up, vascular compl complications, decannulation unintended, and this I put it in parentheses and bolded it. This inflammatory phenomenon that occurs. 
So the first study that I want to discuss is clinical complications during VA ECMO uh, in post-cardiotomy and non-post-cardiotomy shock patients. Uh, and their, their title goes on, Still the Achilles Heel. And this was a multi-center uh, study that was done, comes from various places, Italy, I believe, uh, Poland, uh, the UK, France, several different countries were involved in this. This has to do with the, they reviewed the ELSO database. And uh, what they did was they took adult cardiac cases. There was a total of 9,025 that they reviewed. Of that, 56% survived ECLS but discharged home was 41%. Now, the number that really matters to me is this 41%. Okay, fine, we got them weaned off ECMO, but they died anyway. So really your survival, this number is very consistent with what we know and understand today as being the predicted survival for VA ECMO, generally quoted as 40%, 60% mortality. If it was eCPR, on the other hand, so you're doing, you know, you're you're putting people on on ECMO in the emergency room, in the in the grocery store, whatever the case may be, while you're actually performing CPR on them, they looked at 2,885. The 39% survived the eCPR event. 29% uh, were discharged uh, to either home, I guess, or perhaps L, uh, uh, long-term care of LTAC, long-term uh, long -term acute care. Um, so I, I don't really know. I don't have an answer to that. But that number, given the intensity of eCPR and how dramatic that really is, 29% is pretty doggone good. Uh, because really, you think about it, you're doing CPR in the field. If you don't convert and uh, have ROSC, you know, your, 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 your survival in that case is extremely low, probably zero. Um, and then what they looked at is the various diagnoses that resulted in the ECLS and cardiogenic shock was number one with 40, I'm sorry, was 42% highest in number. Cardiomyopathy was 51%. Is that right? Yeah. Survival. I'm sorry. So Yes, the highest number was cardiogenic shock. The survival, I'm sorry, was 42%. Cardiomyopathy survival was 51%. Myocarditis had the best outcome with 65%. And I think we know that. We hear that a lot now, that myocarditis is a very good indication for ECMO. And you have very good survival with that. And if it was a congenital defect, which we're going to see more and more of with these uh, Patients who had previous congenital heart surgery now becoming adults, we're going to see more of this, had a survival of about 37%. So myocarditis was pretty good. Cardiomyopathy, uh, not too bad. Uh, cardiogenic shock, right about where we expect it to be. And congenital defects, 37%. Uh, I think the jury is still out on that. A few lower number, a little lower than cardiogenic shock. That's certainly the highest that people get experience with. Now, the authors went on to say that despite the increase in the volume of patients, the increased number of member centers in ELSO, in the ELSO registry, and the technological improvements, the incidence of complications has remained largely unchanged. The most common complication has universally been bleeding at the cannula and surgical site from a minimum of 28% in 1997, or the report from 1997, to 46.4% in the report from 2012. In the latest report, the oxygenator failure has decreased considerably down to 0.8% compared to the previous ones where it accounted for approximately 8 to 10%, which oxygenator technology has definitely improved. That I, I can completely wrap my head around. The percentage incidence of neurological complications and infection has been stable in the year's analyses 
From these results, it's important to underline how a successful ECLS program requires appropriate patient selection, skilled ECMO management, and trained providers, and healthcare infrastructure, this is very important, that can help prevent or manage adverse events because they are going to happen, and hence requires considerable resources, including finance and manpower. If I take that whole sentence, or that whole paragraph, and distill it down, it's ECMO technology has improved tremendously. ECMO patient selection has broadened and improved significantly. But ECMO is not a sandbox we can just play in. You have to be committed to an ECMO program. You just can't now and again say, let's just put this patient on ECMO and see what's going to happen. Um, I think that's a terrible disservice to the patient and will likely result in a failed program. You'll have a bad outcome and everyone will say, told you so, Ec no one on ECMO ever survives. I've heard that in many institutions that do not do ECMO. And look, at the end of the day, more people, more hospitals do not, the ho more hospitals that do cardiac surgery. Let me, let me, let me narrow this down. There are many more hospitals that do not perform, that do perform cardiac surgery that do not perform ECMO than hospitals that do perform cardiac surgery and perform ECMO. So, I mean, that's a reality. And I think that as we see the, the, the incredible growth in ECMO utilization and ECMO centers and places doing ECMO, um, if you are currently, let's say you're at a program that does 200 hearts a year, that's not a big program. It's not a small program. It's a smaller to small gram. Um, and you, and you do tabbers, uh, you do high risk PCIs and you think, oh, just having impella is good enough until you lose your right side. And then you're going to do a, a left side and impella and you're going to do a right side and impella and you think it's all that easy to do. Well, you know, putting the patient on ECMO is a whole lot faster, a whole lot simpler, a whole lot less expensive, at least in the short term, for sure. Um, and it's, it's higher resource utilization, but it's way more effective because putting a right-sided impella in under the best of circumstances is challenging for even a really skilled operator. So you're not used to doing it and it's going to be problematic for you. Um, so let me take a quick pause. Vicki, any comments, concerns, uh, added, uh, things you want to add? What year did you say that study was? I'm sorry, I missed it. Which one? The one that you just finished covering. Oh, I'm still covering it, but I'll I'll bring it up here. Um, it yeah. was a it's a multi center study, and they actually reviewed the uh, the uh, 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 ELSO database. And uh, I can't remember all of the locations, but there was I know there was France and there was uh, Poland for sure and Italy. Uh, and I think there were a couple of other countries. I was a little surprised, I guess, by the percentage of the myocarditis. I would have uh, figured that number to be higher. Really? Uh, I usually breathe a little easier when they're myocarditis patients. Even even the fulminant usually has pretty good outcomes. Yes, yes. I yeah, Well, I agree with you. Um, now, the uh, the timing on this was 2018. Um, I'd have to go back and review. You could look that up. I think you could find that if you look it up right now. Uh, that particular study may give you some insight in that. But those were the numbers. This is their chart. I think it might even have been improved since then uh, to mid-70s. But uh, I would have to pull up an article to make sure. Yeah, as far as the survival is concerned? Yeah, for myocarditis in particular, mm -hmm. I think well, only... Only bested by like Takasubu patients. Yeah, you know, as long as and, they're on, they recover. And I exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a great time to use it. But and I think you bring up a very good point. But I think that the reality is, um, when you're dealing with 
multi countries, multi country data. Um, we don't, we, there's a lot of things we don't know. This doesn't mean that they don't, some of them don't do it better than us, but some of them may not do it as well. So you really kind of bringing in a lot of information from a lot of different countries and we don't know what their criteria are. And I think it does complicate things. I think here in the United States, you're uh, maybe United States, Canada, uh, maybe certain countries in Europe where the endocarditis survival rate is much higher than what they have here. But this is their data from the ELSO database. Yeah. And it was kind of like a retrospective kind of analysis of other data. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think that's why. So, that so it has, sense. and I think it's going to continue to improve in everything. I think it will improve. You know, we, we, we always seem to push the envelope a little bit and we're taking on much more challenging cases with a much higher predicted mortality. And we're taking everything we learned from here and translating it over to there. And it's really, you know, we're seeing improvement and in outcomes with patients who before we might not even consider for ECMO. And I think that's what you're going to see. I think ECMO usage will continue to grow and expand and the criteria for ECMO will also expand, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, for instance, like a sepsis is becoming an indication where it used to be contraindicated. Absolutely. 100% agree. Yes. Septic shock is, uh, I, I think, especially you have a younger patient, like 52 or 54 or 56 years old, mm -hmm. absolutely uh, would benefit that patient. I agree. So acute venoarterial ECMO complications and uh I don't want to belabor something silly, but you never write VA ECMO like uh, like this is written <laughs> here. It's always V and then where the dash is, is where the oxygenator goes. Okay. Uh, just for point of reference. Probably didn't need to say that, but. So bleeding complications and you have Coagulation pat pattern using uh, viscoelastic tests like TAG or ROTEM, circuit monitoring for coagulation activation. Uh, and that can only really be done. I do want to mention something real quick. It's not part of my lecture, but it's very important that people understand this. The only way you're going to really know if your oxygenator is getting full of clot is to measure your intraoxygenator blood volume. And the only way you can do that is with the transonic ELSA meter. So, you know, be that as it may, that's a separate aside. You guys can look it up, do whatever you want with it, but that's, that's just a reality. Using a flashlight to look in there is not going to tell you anything. Measuring pressures is not going to tell you anything. You lose 60, 70% of your ECMO surface area and not have a significant change in your pressures because of channeling and the way things work around that problem. So keep that in mind. Um, transfusion based on single fat that, that says single, but there's no such word, single factor and, uh, and cells like using red blood cells when appropriate, FFP when appropriate, cryoprecipitate when appropriate, et cetera. Antifibrinolytic agents like amicar, transexamic acid, fibrinogen, um, using, uh, um, uh, prothrombin complex concentrates, platelets, uh, plasma, circuit change in case of evidence of activated coagulation by circuit clots. So basically you have blue is your problem, gray is your uh, management, and green, uh, uh, management of the complication, and then uh, green is your, uh, and it should say it right here, just the uh, green is the uh, management of the ECMO complication, uh, 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 complication. so sorry. So the gray is the flow chart uh, of the assessment and then green is your, what you do about it. Uh, for neurologic complications, standard monitoring, you have physical examination, EEG, NEARS, which I think we should be using much more of. We do not use enough NEARS. Uh, transcranial Doppler, I, I'm a big believer in that. Brain CT when appropriate, uh, and MRI. You can't do an MRI when you're on ECMO, so that's not going to happen. I disagree with that. I would cross that out. 
We can't bring an ECMO into the uh, magnet. Uh, there's future challenging monitoring of brain injury. There's biomarkers that they're looking at. They're listed here. Vascular complications, limb perfusion examinations using Doppler ultrasound on the limb and Doppler uh, distal perfusion catheters. Uh, in case of ischemia, backflow cannula placement, thromboembolic uh, vascular repair or, or, or surgical, change cannula position, fasciotomy in the case of compartment syndrome, uh, infection, gas exchange, active surveillance and cultures, rectal swab weekly, hemodynamic and ventilatory parameters, and um, what is uh, HR, high resolution chest tomography for, uh, I'm assuming you would do that for uh, pneumonias or something like that. Is that right? Or maybe uh, empyemas? Vicki, I'll ask you. Yeah, I don't know about that one, but it sounds like it would be the proper indication. Mm -hmm. And then early broad spectrum antibiotic therapy, adequate antibiotic uh, de-escalation, therapeutic drug monitoring, very important because if you take the ECMO course, you will learn that you will sequester uh, certain antibiotics in your ECMO and your titer in the patient is lower than you want it to be. So it's very important to be monitoring those titers and your peaks and your troughs. Reduction of vascular access and uh, dedicated nursing. You have to have nurses who are trained in managing patients on ECMO. You cannot just take any nurse and say, go take care of the ECMO patient tonight when it's your first week in the ICU, and before that you were on med surge. That's a bad idea. So we've all seen this, right? The dilated heart. This is a patient who is central cannulated. And here you can see the right heart is way distended. You see it here. The pulmonary artery is very pronounced. Um, your aorta is over here. Your LV is way back behind this picture where you can't even see it. Um, and you can see the tissue is all swollen and edematous. And this patient is currently on ECMO. So that looks really bad. Um, in many ways, I've seen this happen before. And in many ways, I think this is a, uh, a failure of fluid management. Uh, this patient is grossly, severely uh, edematous because of third spacing of volume, and nothing ever works well. So that's uh, my view on that patient. This doesn't even look like a real picture, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the cleanest looking cannulation site I think I have ever seen in my life. I don't believe I've ever seen one that looks that clean. There's a little bit of blood down here that I see, just barely, but uh, man, that's a clean wound. This on the right is what I'm really more used to seeing. You see the river of blood coming down, and then it's probably making its way down into the bed over here. Um, more consistent with what I see, you can see there's a lot of blood staining around the wound. Um, and everything else, but here's your distal perfusion cannula, here's your distal perfusion cannula here, but that's not an uncommon sight, uh, but this river of blood that you see here turns into a torrent of blood at some point in time, and we end up packing this with surgicel and dressings and pressure dressings and holding the heparin and trying to do all these things to try and control that bleeding. So in the annals of thoracic surgery in 2014, we find another study looking at the complications of, of uh, uh, ECMO for treatment of cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest. This is a meta-analysis of 1,866 adult patients. And this is from Cedar sinai in Los Angeles and also the uh, Cleveland Clinic up in Cleveland, Ohio. And here are all of the studies that they reviewed with the number of patients that were in these studies, the patient type, whether it was post-cardiac surgery, uh, post-cardiotomy syndrome, PCCS, or whether it was mixed, or whether it was 
um, uh, 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 acute MI, AMI, uh, whether they had a balloon pump, all of these uh, various different things, CA being cardiac arrest in this particular uh, study. Then look, the average age was uh, 60, 51 going on down the list here. What I thought was very interesting was the age range, and I can see some really aggressive institutions here. The 75, that's getting close, but 83, 83, 83, 84, um, 80 years old. Those are some, 81, those are some pretty old patients, 76. Um, in a lot of places, that is a contraindication when they're that old. Uh, for VA ECBO, especially for post-cardiotomy uh, post uh, uh, circulatory shock, uh, post-cardiotomy cardiogenic shock. And then here is the percentage of the patients that were on peripheral ECMO. If it wasn't peripheral, it was central. 64%, 100%, 88%, 67 99 100 100 and so forth. 27%. So they used a lot of central cannulation with these folks here. And they did a lot. They did 517 of them, of which this percentage had an intraoretic balloon pump first or as well. The average time that the patients were on ECMO, and you see very quickly that people who are on VA ECMO are not nearly as long a run as you're going to find with VV ECMO. Here is your survival to discharge. 30%, 27%. Let's go to these folks over here. 65%. That was really good. Um, I don't have all of the reasons, but it was mixed for a variety of reasons. And they had great survival to discharge. Uh, that program that we saw with uh, 517, they had 25%, 24.8%, but they were pretty aggressive. They went all the way up to 84 years of age. I think that's, uh, uh, they were a pretty aggressive program. But you can see the numbers are uh, pretty consistent around the 30 to 40% range, some lower, but around that area, which you would expect with VA ECMO. The rates of complications. Now, I thought this was very interesting. So you have AKI, which is here. You have... Uh, lower extremity amputation, LEA. You have lower extremity ischemia, LEI. Uh, lower extreme, uh, you have uh, renal replacement therapy, RRT, whether required that or not. Bleeding, re-operation uh, for bleeding or rethoracotomy or re-median re, uh, sternotomy and significant infection. And the number of studies that address these various issues so you can see that lower leg ischemia um, pooled estimated rate is not uncommon. Uh, but what I thought was the most interesting, my takeaway message from this is this line right here, which is your AKI. And AKI right under it requiring renal replacement therapy of some sort, whether it be intermittent dialysis or it be C uh, continuous uh, therapy was 46%. Very, very, very high number. Pretty high, 13% in the neurologic range, but nothing compares to acute kidney injury and need for renal replacement therapy. Bleeding was very high. Reoperation for bleeding was very high. And the uh, other one's overt stroke was at 5.9%. Still high, but, uh, but, yeah, you know, kidney injury, absolutely number one. I think that is something we have seen for a very long time. And this is a graph essentially saying the exact same thing, just a different way of expressing it. The lines that you see here are the range, and then the big blocks is the pooled percentage. And here you see AKI and uh, required wound replacement therapy, major bleeding, and reoperation for bleeding significant infection. Um, and that doesn't surprise me either. These patients are immunocompromised. They are going to be, and they're going to 
get infections. We see it all of the time. And you have to be very proactive with it. You have to be really aware of it. And when you're on ECMO and you're using a heater cooler device and you're keeping the patient at 37 degrees and their white count's actually going up and you're not noticing it yet, they're spiking a temperature, but you're masking it. So you, you get this false sense that nothing is happening, but something is happening and you need to be aware of that. So analysis of adverse events related to ECMO from a nationwide database of patient safety accidents in Japan. Now, this was in 2022. And I'm going to tell you, the Japanese have a reputation for being very aggressive. But I have to, when I read this particular article, um, it, it really got my attention. I sent it to you, Vicky. Did you read the article? Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. So it's a really, really interesting article. So they reviewed a, a thousand and forty-two reports. Now, somehow, this was about ECMO. Only a hundred and seventy-eight of that thousand ended up in this analysis because 806 of the reports weren't associated with ECMO. So I, I don't know how 864 reports were excluded after free text review of the following reasons for the fall or for the following reasons. Um, and then the other uh, part was, so reports weren't associated with ECMO and in 58 of them, it was cardiopulmonary bypass in the operating room and not ECMO. So mechanical cardiopulmonary support only during surgery. Um, and we're talking about accidents. So all uh, right away, I see an accident already having occurred. Somehow you get 864 uh, reports that aren't even germane to what your question actually was. But this is what really got my attention. The blue bars are events that resulted in death. The yellow bars are high potential for residual disability. Red is low potential for residual disability. Green is no potential for it. And, bl and the uh, black or dark blue is unknown. I think it's dark blue, but the light blue. So cannula malposition accounted for the largest amount of death associated with cannulation. We're going to get a little deeper into this here in a minute. Decannulation had a pretty high incidence that resulted in death and resulted in residual injury. And then you go through bleeding, which you expect, air and circuit, thromboembolism, limb ischemia, gas supply issues, um, power source issue, and foreign body remnants. I, I don't know what that one was. I don't know what the foreign body was or where it was, so I'm not sure. I, I did not, that was not elucidated in the study itself. But let's look at it, okay? Let's, let's, let's look at the detail of this. So here are the patient ages up here, all right? You can see they had 16% were over 80 years old, 30% between 70 and 79. That's pretty aggressive and pretty impressive. Um, only 20% were between 20 and 59 for uh, assuming the reason being that not very many 20 or 59 per, uh, year olds need uh, this kind of support, but it's would have been a higher percentage if you cut out some of this. So that percentage would have been much higher. Um, types of ECMO, you have veno-arterial ECMO, 28% of the time, venous-venous, 26% of the time, and eCPR was the remaining 46%. So that's a high number. That's a lot of eCPR. Vessel of insertion, right femoral vein, 18%, and so forth. We don't have to go through all of those. But he, this is very uh, striking. The wrong vessel was cannulated 14% of the time. Now, the injury site was either retro or intraperitoneal structures, 54%. So 
you're putting the cannula in and you go through the uh, through the vessel into the retroperitoneum or intraperitoneal space. Mediastinal and thoracic structures, 18%. Cannula site itself, meaning I guess that like vessel injury would be 8%. Cardiac injury, you put the cannula in and you perf the heart, 6%. Wrong vessel, again, we discussed this, 14%. Now, injury site from the femoral vein or artery, retroperitoneal is 82% of the time. Cannulation site, mediastinal thoracic structures, and so forth. Injury site, if it was the right IJ, then the mediastinal and thoracic structures was 80% of the time, and 20%, the heart itself was injured. Now, this gets even more interesting. Operator specialty, emergency intensive care was 36% of their cannulations were done by emergency or intensive care. Vicki, I say this for you. That particular thing right here, I'm going to circle it. I'm going to circle it in red. I brought this up. just for you. Do you know why? Why? Do you know anybody that is in intensive care that would like to cannulate patients? <laughs> so we'll move on from there. Cardiology. I, I think, we're just going to interesting. We're going to move they're on. They're including like the eCPR cannulating during compressions is part of that percentage. Yes, uh, for cannula they are. malposition, which but makes I, more sense. But it does, and I think numbers. it does explain because when I first saw the study, I was like, "What the heck?" I was reading. I was like, "What yeah, the heck am I reading crazy. here? This is nuts!" But then I got into it, and you're a hundred percent right. They are including that, but I do think that that is germane because you can be in the cath lab. I just had it happen. We were doing a TAVR. The TAVR went south. We were doing CPR. Now, that's not classic eCPR in the emergency room, and we are in a completely different environment with imaging and people who have a lot of really good wire skills and cannulation skills. It was still a challenge. And I think that it just shows the, 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 the level of sophistication and acceptance, probably more important, acceptance of problems that can occur when you embark on an eCPR program. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, for sure. I I actually tend to think that the ECPR group of patients should be separated in most of these studies because they they don't run the same risks and the percentages are skewed. Agreed. I agree. But it does at least show you that you can have serious mediastinal and thoracic structure, structure injury, cardiac itself injured, Wrong vessel being cannulated can happen a lot. Um, so serious concerns. Now, thoracic cardiovascular surgery cannulated 26% of the time, 34% for cardiology, and thoracic surgeons cannulated 3%. Look, I can tell you the Japanese are, I think, very aggressive. I think that they are known for this. They are known for being very aggressive, and they do things that we here in this country are much less, are much more risk averse of. And I think that this is what happens when you have that environment. Not that it's bad, because if the mortality was going to be 100% with nothing, this isn't so bad. But it's, it is interesting. Um, operators clinical experience. Now, I thought this was interesting too. One to five years, 14%. Six to 10 years was 34%. So those are the guys I think that are still really having fun with this. 11 to 15%, it drops off a little bit. 16 to 20% was 8%. 
and I can't explain why 22% were greater than 21 years of experience. You would think they'd be the ones that were like, give it to the younger guy to do. But maybe it's because they call them because they know they can do it with a lot fewer complications. It's hard for me to say. 36%. I think this is a good study for pointing out why it's so difficult for so many centers to get an ECPR program started effectively because uh, it's not something that just any physician can do. It's difficult for some cardiothoracic surgeons to cannulate somebody that does not have a blood pressure. And you don't have imaging. And you don't have imaging in the and field. I'm gonna so get to, I'm gonna, and I'm going to get to that. And I'm going to get to that. Absolutely. Cath, uh, the cath lab, 24%. ICU, 24%. Operating room was only 12%. General care ward, 4%. So they brought it up to the med surge floor or to the ortho floor where they had a PE and they just went ahead and put the patient on ECMO right there and then wheeled them down to the ICU from there. That is what they did. Now, let's look over here at table two. The level of harm that occurred from these various different instances. Well, if you had an unplanned, complete decannulation, you died. There was no ands, ifs, or buts about it. 100% fatal, which is something that I've said, if you remember uh, me saying it, that if you decannulate, if I'm sitting there, if I'm standing right there, any, me, you, any ECMO specialist is literally standing at the foot of the bed while the cannula becomes dislodged, removed, whether it be the venous side or the arterial side, if the patient is ECMO dependent, the patient's not going to survive. Would you agree with that? I mean, what if the patient was almost ready to wean? No, I said the patient was ECMO dependent. Well, then, yeah, I agree. If the patient is ECMO dependent, yes. If the patient is ready to wean, yes, you can, yes, you would survive that. As long as you, let's say you took the arterial out, you'd have to do it before you exsanguinated the patient because the ECMO was still flowing. If you took the venous side out, you got to stop the air from getting into the arterial system. So there are some issues and then control the bleeding from the vessel itself. So, but yes, you could survive it. I would agree with you could survive. But if you're ECMO dependent, then no, you're not surviving it. Or if you have a impella in place already that can carry a little bit of the weight for you for a while. Maybe, maybe, maybe so. Maybe. Okay. There were no incomplete decannulations, so that didn't even count. The arterial was the more likely to be decannulated unintentionally and completely. The venous was only at 9% or an additional arterial cannula of the lower extremity, meaning a distal perfusion cannula. I am shocked that that's at 6%. Shocked. Absolutely shocked. But it is. Oh, I'm so sorry. Physician, what caused this to happen? Physicians performing another, gosh, dog it, another procedure 41% of the time. Position change of the patient, 32%. Moving the patient, so it happened in the elevator. That's got to be bad. <laughs> Body motion, an unknown cause. I know what the unknown cause was. It's not unknown. The patient reached up, was not secured, grabbed it, and yanked it out. That's what happened. Consider, considered factors. Insufficient fixing was the cannulas were not sewn in, secured well enough. Blinded inserting position, lack of good communication, insufficient sedation, and obese patients were more likely because you, you, a lot of, I've seen that before where they're cannulated in the femoral artery and the cannula is almost not long enough to make it all the way into the vessel. It's just barely in there. I've seen that happen before. So there you go there. So that concludes my first part of this lecture. I think I'm right on time, right? I just finished about an hour. So that was about perfect. So any questions from the audience? Any questions from you, Vicki? Any thoughts about the mechanical bad things that can happen. We haven't talked yet about the physiologic derangements. That's next. 
I just wanted to talk about the mechanical aspects of what can go wrong. Very good. Thoughts, comments? Anyone from the audience? Anybody want to call in? Does anybody want to do a sympathy call? Anything. Magic, why don't you just call our studio from right there? Okay. <laughs> okay. We're ready to go on. Is everybody ready to go on? Let's move on. Yes. Everyone's saying yes. You've seen this before. I showed it to you. We're not going to go over it again, but I hopefully is imprinted in your mind. We talked about this already, so I can skip this slide. So we're going to get now into the fun part. This beautiful, well, we're looking at a kidney here, but this beautiful, elegant structure called the endothelial glycocalyx, which is highlighted in green on the right side. And the glycocalyx is, we're all familiar with it, a carbohydrate-rich gel layer that lines vascular endothelia. Uh, and uh, the glycocalyx and endothelial cell damage can be caused by ischemia and reperfusion injury, inflammatory processes, sepsis, hemorrhagic shock, hypervolemia, hyperglycemia. In fact, that's something that, uh, that uh, 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 Thomas was asking me about yesterday during the program is uh, elevated sugars, you know, severe hyperglycemia, it can damage the uh, glycocalyx. I know it has, it definitely deranges the, um, the uh, microcirculation and something that we want to treat and not allow to happen. It can be caused by excessive shear stress and coronary artery bypass surgery. I'm not sure it's just a coronary artery bypass surgery or it's the fact that we go on cardiopulmonary bypass for the coronary artery bypass surgery, but it could be also damaged by uh, doing your arteriotomies, putting dilators down, uh, sewing, irrigating, Mr. Blowers, all of these things can have an effect on your endothelial glycocalyx. So this is a very simplified, oversimplified, really, uh, diagram. But first, let's look at, to the right side. The glycocalyx is degraded via inflammatory mechanisms. We talked uh, about uh, the various different things, but you get vascular hyperpermeability, upregulated vasodilatation, vasoplegia, if you will, microvessel thrombosis. I'm going to show you some really cool videos about this, and leukocyte adhesion. And that's a real problem when you get leukocyte infiltration into your capillary wall. And, uh, and, and leaving and getting into the interstitial spaces. Hypervolemia increased glycocal increases glycocalyx degradation, and albumin and FFP and heparin are protective and help to repair it, protect it against shedding and contributing to the maintenance of vascular integrity and uh, provides for normal capillary permeability. So we want to protect the glycocalyx. And here you see fluid overload and pump failure, RV and LV, ends up in, with venous congestion, which comes down here. And then you have pump failure, hypovolemia, vasodilatation, whether it be from sepsis or severe inflammatory response syndrome, it gives you an inadequate arterial supply which comes down here, which ends up creating organ hypoperfusion, leading to tissue hypoxia, hypoxia, endothelial organ dysfunction, inflammatory, systemic inflammatory response syndro uh, syndrome, and vasodilatation, which comes back up here. And this continues to perpetuate upon itself, leading to multi-organ system dysfunction and failure, and then later death. So here we see the uh, plasma, pro the glycocalyx here. This is the capillary lumen here. This is your endothelial layer here. This is your glycocalyx here. This is your intracellular space over here. And uh, plasma proteins such as albumin and antithrombin are bound within the glycocalyx, contributing to its stability. You see that here. And of course, we all know that uh, albumin is a is the major determinant of plasma osmotic pressure. 
Um, and uh, that that is very true. I think that albumin accounts for 60 or 70 percent of our uh, uh, oncotic pressure. And I believe it was just this past week I was listening to Michelle Lee giving her lecture on uh, a pharmacology lecture, which was exquisite. It was absolutely terrific. And colloid oncotic pressure is a redundant term. Colloid oncotic can only be colloidal. So oncotic pressure is appropriate. But if, for a laboratory analysis, a COP, colloid oncotic pressure, is what is measured. Albumin is about 60 to 70% of that force that we need. Um, and uh, so there's that. This is a wonderful photograph. You know, we all think this is a, scan out, a scanning electron micro, uh, micrograph of a cross-sectional image of a coronary artery and its endothelial, uh, endothelial glycocalyx. And we think of the inside of vessels as being nice and smooth. I got these slides from you, Vicky. Didn't these are your slides? I stole these are the ones you sent me, right? Yes. Yes, they were great. I loved your slides. Your slides are great. Um, but you see it's not smooth at all. It's this hair like almost like 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 grass. Uh, it's very, very interesting, but it's very, very fine um, material here, mostly carbohydrate uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in constituency. And here we see an intact uh, glycocalyx and you see your leukocyte coming down and it is deterred. You have normal permeability. Here you have a degraded glycocalyx, and you see your increased permeability, and you see your uh, your uh, uh, leukocytes egressing out of the vascular space through the uh, cellular wall, through the capillary wall. You have a loss of coagulation control, loss of antioxidant defense, loss of deposition, uh, deposited growth factors, and this increased permeability. You can also lose, once you have this increased permeability, your albumin. That can be actually perpetuate a problem and have, a cap have capillary leak syndrome, which is absolutely devastating and disastrous. You want to avoid that. So preventive measures is to avoid hypervolemia and hypovolemia, both. You want to avoid big, large shifts in volume. Now, hypovolemia is, it, 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 there are a tremendous number of studies out there that drier patients do better. Uh, Vicki, you can give me your opinion of that, but that it, from my, from when I look at the, in, the, the, the studies out there on fluid management of critically ill patients, drier patients do better. Uh, but there's an argument that it results in AKI, and we can we're going to get into that a little bit further for a little bit. But that's a whole different topic. Albumin infusions critical to uh, to benefiting the patients and maintaining the integrity of your glycocalyx, your endothelial glycocalyx, antithrombin three. Um, I don't know what MMP inhibitors are, heparinase inhibitors, nitrox oxide donors and uh, salodoxide, sal I don't know what that is either. Um, do you know what those are, Vicki? No. I don't, I don't know Not what those the top are. Of my head. Yeah, but uh, anyway, there is a lot of research being done on using liposomes with pre-assembled glycocalyx to help restore the function. Um, but again, I think that's another topic for another day and deep in science and I'm more of a nuts and bolts kind of big picture person. Uh, it gets very detailed in the physiology of all this stuff, but that is an emerging research that uh, is worth uh, discussing. Now, this I think so is fascinating. Go, yes. Yes. Uh, go back a couple slides. I can one right there on that one. So you see the, the like little hair filaments that extend farther out than the rest of the glycocalyx. Yes, right here. Those are uh, actually a layer of the glycocalyx. It's kind of fishing in the blood, so to speak, right? Their mm -hmm. job is to catch uh, hormones, glucose, insulin, those type of things, and allow them through the tight junctions on the other side of the glycocalyx. So when you have a, an abundance of glucose hyperglycemia in there, these keys become saturated and they uh, 
they spread and expose a deeper layer of the glycocalyx that isn't as resilient against those shear stresses and causes it to break down a little faster. Uh, same thing with the hypervolemia. If you spread those tight junctions just with the stretch of the endothelial wall itself, you're, you're basically opening up those tight junctions. Same thing in the, uh, in the intestine has the, uh, the glycocalyx as well. And uh, it's uh, associated issues there would be like with celiacs and ir irritable bowel syndrome always have the same problems with those tight junctions not functioning like they should. Uh, so that, that kind of gives a little bit of more information on that one. That's very good. Thank you for that. That, was ver that, was a, that really helped me understand it a lot better too. Thank you. This, now this is really cool. I had one of these devices. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the microcirculation uh, sublingually. And you're going to be able to see density of capillary beds and microvessels. Uh, micro you're going to see red cells. You're going to see white cells. You're going to see uh, all kinds of really interesting structures and features that are related to weaning a patient off of ECMO. The first part is successful. The second one is going to be unsuccessful. And you're going to see what happens when you have circulatory collapse or in ineffective circulation going on, necessitating the need for mechanical circulatory support. So watch carefully. And that's just a beautiful picture. And those, those bright spots you see that flash through quickly are white cells. Now here you see a failed uh, uh, weaning attempt, and you can see how the density of the vessels tremendously changed. And if you look, you can even see white cells right here. Oh, doggone it. I want to go back and do that again actually leaving the vessels. So look down in the lower left-hand corner. I, hopefully I can show this. It's gonna be on the, the, the one that's weaning, that's failed. Here, right here. You see that? You see them up here too. Here. It's a fascinating um, illustration of what you actually can see. It, uh, it was microvascular scan that had sent me one, and I used it uh, in the operating room on a number of occasions for some hearts and got some incredible images. But, uh, and I wanted to do it with some of our ECMO patients, but we just didn't have enough. I couldn't get enough people to support using it. They wanted to do IRB. Um, I struggled and struggled and struggled, but it was an incredible tool. Um, and I had to send it back to them because I, I, I couldn't buy it. I couldn't afford to buy it. Um, and then not really be able to use it. And we weren't going to use it for clinical. It was mostly for academic interest, but it was fascinating to watch when you go on bypass and you have all of that hemodilution what happened to the sublingual microcirculation was just incredible. And then we did pulsatile perfusion and looked at that. We did uh, continuous flow, flow going up, flow going down, putting the clamp on and taking the clamp off. And it was really impressive to see the microcirculation responding to all of those things that we did on cardiopulmonary bypass. And it, get, it brought me to the conclusion that there's nothing that I do that's good for anybody. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, ECMO and cytokine uh, production. And in this particular study, they're talking about cytokine adsorption. But there's information in this study that is germane to our conversation today. And one of the things that happens when we put patients on ECMO is you immediately get IL-6 signaling, which results in capillary leakage. So inflammatory mediators is, are a real problem in any 
extracorporeal circulatory device, whether it be VA ECMO, VV ECMO, or standard cardiopulmonary bypass, or angiovac procedure for that matter. Something we have to seriously take into consideration. It's usually well tolerated, especially for short run cardiopulmonary bypass procedures, three hours or less, but it's a lot less tolerated when the surgery takes six hours on bypass or longer, or you have somebody on ECMO for three days, four days, five days, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. Um, leukocyte infiltration is a big, a big deal. Um, tissue edema occurs and results from that, pulmonary edema. And um, you really want to target the removal of IL-6 for the preservation of your endothelial glycocalyx. It's very important. So the natural effect of any pathogen is IL-4, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10, and TNF, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha, sepsis and sepsis shock, and what I call septic shock syndrome. Uh, uh, Vicki, I'd like your, your participation in this, but I see patients that are in a gross inflammatory reaction and their hemodynamics all say this patient is in septic shock, but they're not septic. What they are is septic shock syndrome. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah I think so. We all agree on that? I okay. agree with that. Well, some people think that's a little controversial when I say that, but I do believe I see it a lot. I've seen it many, many, many times, and I'm very confident that that is the case. They just are hung up on this idea that I'm saying septic shock syndrome. So I could say septic-like syndrome, but I think it's because I'm using the word septic and we're not talking about an actual infection. Anyway, foreign surface contact area uh, is what is going to precipitate this blood air interface, your pump suckers on bypass, uh, an air leak in your venous line, whatever the case may be, uh, activates your coagulation cascade, neutrophilic infiltration, and bradykinins and calocrine results in more inflammatory excitation. And basically, it's an injury inflammation results in activation, which causes more injury and inflammation, which is more activation. And it keeps doing this and doing this and doing this. And you get worse and worse and worse and worse. You have to do something to stop this vicious cycle. I refer to all of these things as evil humors. And I would suggest that um, you all do too, because there's good interleukins, there's bad interleukins, um, there's pro-inflammatory mediators, there's anti-inflammatory mediators, and you can literally get stuck on all of this stuff. So my solution is to call everything bad an evil humor. If you find that humorous, you could let me know. Um, a healthy immune response, that's the best I could do, is you have an inflammatory response and you have a regulatory uh, response. And these generally balance each other. So you have pro-inflammatory mediators, pro, and you have anti-inflammatory mediators. And we're kept in balance by the anti-inflammatory mediators and the pro-inflammatory mediators. A, in a cytokine storm, you have such a massive inflammatory reaction that it overwhelms the regulatory response. And in many ways, it downregulates it to where your disproportionate level, your disproportionate and your level of pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory keeps moving in the wrong direction. You have to be able to reset that. Well, two of the probably smartest people that I've ever known in my life, one whom I've met briefly, um, and the other I would like to meet one day, uh, this fella here on the left is Claudio Ronco, and he's from Vincenza, Italy. He's a nephrologist and intensivist, uh, br absolutely brilliant guy. I, I, I was around him one day when he was talking, and he spoke 
three or four different languages in one conversation. Uh, but here he is doing a program that he used to do called Cappuccino with Dr. Ronco. And I thought that was kind of funny being an Italian. Uh, this guy over here is Dr. Ronaldo Bolomo, and he is from Australia, I believe Perth. And he is an intensive care medicine doctor. And these two guys combined, along with other people, there's John Kellum and there's uh, 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 Dr. Honoré. I can't think of his first name. But regardless, these guys wrote the textbook really on CRRT, on continuous renal replacement therapy, which I prefer to call continuous veno veno hemofiltration. It's different. But with that said, that's a different debate. It's a different topic. I know this is something that Vicky is very, very involved with and very knowledgeable about. But Claudio Ronco and uh, Ronaldo Bolomo, two incredible geniuses when it comes to managing patients uh, in the critical care unit, whether it be on ECMO and having gross inflammatory, systemic inflammatory response or circulatory collapse due to sepsis or acute kidney injury, acute renal failure, and how to manage this fluid mismanagement, acid-base derangements, severe, and everything else. So they've written a whole bunch of stuff, and it's very controversial. So CVVH uh, and using ultra-high volume or intensive CVVH is a controversial topic, and it is not CVVHD. You will see people that are using CVVHD, which is continuous veno veno hemodialysis, for inflammatory mediator mitigation. It doesn't work because all you're depending on is diffusion. It's dialysis. That's all it is, which, res which is only going to rely on passive, diffusive, concentration gradient uh, removal, and it's going to be very good for very small ions and cations, and that's all. Convection versus diffusion is a very important concept. So this... Up on the top, this is not this. And you just have to grasp that concept before you can ever understand how this works and why it works, okay? And you can see by the circuit, blood goes in, blood goes out, uh, a dialysate goes in and a dialysate goes out, and you're just using diffusion. Whereas in hemofiltration, you are pulling volume out, concentrating the blood and replacing that volume with what you want the plasma water to look like, which is generally sans inflammatory mediators. This technique of convection can remove anything from, you know, less than 5 kD to up to 50 kD whereas this is only going to remove somewhere between less than 5 kD to maybe 7 kD, maybe 10 at the very, very best. I don't even think it could get that high. you have any thoughts on that, Vicki? Those numbers seem about right? They do seem about right. Okay, fair enough. And so, I mean, the only way that you can remove something that large is to add that immense pressure gradient. So yes. you don't even have necessarily dialysate on the other side of that membrane. You actually have the fluid in the tubing with the blood going at a rate that can create that pressure gradient instead of yes. a concentration gradient. You need a very high transmembrane pressure and use yes. a pump only to control the volume as it is being pushed through the pores and that solvent drag is what allows a uh, dialysis membrane to remove very large structures. And most inflammatory mediators range between 10 and 50 kD or 50,000 Daltons or 50 kilodaltons, whichever you prefer. That's the range of most inflammatory mediators. Now, there are some that you have to use a hemopurification technique like Cytosorb, where you have to use adsorption. The molecule is protein bound. You just cannot remove it 
with hemofiltration at all. But those exceptional cases, you should be using a cytosorb filter. Um, so you have to take that, you have to use the right tool for the right circumstances. But what this illustrates here, and this article, by the way, came out of anesthesiology, I have the reference right here, um, is the, here you see in the green, uh, in the tissue, bacteria, large amounts of bacteria, and very few leukocytes. Because you have a signaling and translocation of these leukocytes because of how many of these cytokines that you see here that are circulating in the blood. Now, removing those and getting it to a normal level helps to bring the leukocytes to stop that signaling get them back into the source of the infection to be able to reduce the level of your bacteria, your, whatever your infectious process is. And that is what high intensity hemofiltration does from an inflammatory mediator perspective. Because if you have high inflammatory mediators, high cytokines in your bloodstream, you will have leukocyte signaling and that will become a very big problem for you. That's where I get this term, septic-like shock. Um, here we see what high volume hemofiltration looks like, and the dose is either in milliliters per kilogram per hour, and here are the various studies. You can see that they're dated that's the problem with uh, with CVVH is it, it is poorly studied because studies are extremely difficult to do. It's not because they're not effective studies, but they're very hard to do. It's very hard for somebody to say, I'm going to randomize you to intermittent dialysis or I'm going to randomize you to low volume or low intensity hemofiltration when I know you would get better if I put you on high intensity and I just can't sit here and let you die. So I'm going to put you on high intensity. I'm going to help you get better. Then I'm going to put you to low intensity again. And we're going to publish the study with this as a caveat. It's an impossible study to do. So, but let's look at these, these numbers because I think it's very important. Um, the dose in this particular case was 200 milliliters per kilogram per hour. In this study here, it was a set rate of four liters, 4,000 milliliters per hour. This was at 65, at 70, at six liters, 115 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So think about that if you had a patient who weighed 100 kilograms, okay? That's a lot of replacement volume. For reference, and I think this is so incredibly important, what I see the prescription being written as is CVVHD blood flow at 200 and the dialysate rate at two liters. And this patient weighs 100 kilos. So that's, that's, that's literally, it's nothing. And it's all dialysis. Even when they do convective therapy, when we convince them and they do CVVHDF, they're like, okay, fine. Run your post-filter replacement, which is the only part that's going to be convective at 500 milliliters per hour. Compare that, maybe even a thousand. Compare that to six liters per hour. And look at this, survival, when you did high volume versus standard, your survival went from 21 to 45%. It went from 68 to 94%. It went from 21 to 45%. It went from 30 to 54, 30 to 53, and 37 to 60, 27 to 55, 65 to 91. Consistently, what you expect to see, your predicted survival on this patient to what was 
what your actual survival survival was. It's just incredible at how effective this therapeutic modality can be if used properly. And people are afraid. There's, I'm telling you, Vicki, please add to this. There's, they, they, it's, it's like I talked to nephrologist. It gets turned over to nephrology, and they're like, well, you know, I know the patient's not making much urine right now, but they were, and let's just give them some Lasix, and let's give them some volume. The patient looks like they're a water balloon. They're about to pop. And, well, let's just give them a little more volume. No, it's a bad idea. Because everything that Vicky elucidated earlier, their, their, their heart is stretched. Their venous capacitance system is stretched. Their arterial system is stretched. This endothelial glycocalyx is no longer functioning the way it should. And we are perpetuating a very bad problem. We've got to get volume off these patients. And we have to mitigate this, 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 this volume issue and inflammatory mediator. Uh, now, there are two different concepts. I think this is very important to talk about. Um, you have a concept where you have, remember I talked about you have pro and you have anti-inflammatory mediators. And when your pro-inflammatory mediators are way high and your anti-inflammatory mediators are depressed, the concept is because you remove both pro and anti-inflammatory mediators with CVVH, high volume CVVH as well. You, you are removing both. But because there are disproportionately much more of the pro, you will remove them disproportionately. And eventually what you're trying to do is get this level reset so that the balance is reestablished. That's the 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 removal. One of the theories in high volume hemofiltration. That sound about right? That I mean, sound about right to you? Yes. Thank yes. you. Okay. And that those dose that you gave there, that wasn't even hitting the minimum dosage requirements from. KDigo or whatnot. No, when you uh, everything you probably come out to like eighteen or nineteen on the dosing is just ridiculous for HDF. And I'm with you. I bang my head against the wall because HDF in particular is frustrating. It's two different modes uh, that doesn't mean to half the dosage on each mode and still come out with one therapy. You're just doing half the dosage on each therapy. Right. Uh, for Correct. the convection, you have to dose for convection and you have to dose for dialysis and do both at the same time, not reduce them both. It makes me crazy. Correct. I agree with you 100 percent. Absolutely true. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the 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 work that Ronco did and Belomo did, uh, which again, and Dr. Maida, too, he's in San Diego. I think there's a lot of these guys that have done a lot, um, but uh, they're impressive people. But but his work is anything less than 35 milliliters per kilogram per hour of your final dose, understanding that you will have to stop it occasionally and restart it. So you have to look at it over a 24 hour period of time. You're so you're going to have to be higher than that. You're going to have to be at around 40 On average, cc's. Just subtract four from your dose. And that's what you're losing with stoppage. Right. And there will be stoppage. There'll be alarms. You got to change the bags, all these various different things. So that's absolutely correct. Um, and then this very nice study I thought was very interesting when it comes to intensity of your CVVH. Um, this is your best practice window for renal support. And if you look here, your intensity, your, your, your survival goes up as your intensity increases and somewhere in this window is your Goldilocks zone and then your benefit decreases over time. So there is a place where it is optimal and the same thing for in the dashed line, your blood purification strategies for sepsis is it, and this is using high uh, intensity hemofiltration, not a, a particular cytosorb. But you see here 
that your survival continues to increase with intensity, and then you hit a plateau here in this particular range, which is way out here at 50 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So that's, that's, that's a lot. We're generally down in this range here is what Vicky is saying, which is, it's not, it's, it's, you're, you're treating yourself. You're not really treating the patient when you do it this way, but it's very difficult because a lot of nephrologists are very scared of doing these high intensity techniques. But the times that I have used it, the times that I have seen it used, I have seen remarkable turnarounds in patients and it really does make a, uh, an enormous difference. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I'm a little bit early. Let me see if we have any uh, comments here. Uh, let me see. Let's see what we have. Hey, Joe. Hey, Jeff. Um, <laughs> Michael. Hey, God bless you, Vicki. Michael you. Wynn, hey, how are you? Eric Taman, Derek Hebert, uh, Ahmad Dabul from Syria. Oh my God, what time is it in the day there? It must be in the middle of the night or early, early in the morning, I guess maybe. But yeah. welcome, nice to talk to you. Kevin Gar Kelvin Garcia, we've seen you several times, I know you. Jeremy, thank you for your work. Mr. Basha, love watching and learning from you and your guests, thank you very much. Fabian, Jeff. Also ventricular and or AO valve thrombus if no injection. Yes, Jeff, I did not put that on there and it should have been under this slide. Let me just go to it. You are 100% correct. That's right here. I should have added that to this section right here. 100% agree. And low anticoagulant. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know, Jeff. We did a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, ECMO with no anticoagulation, uh, even with COVID patients where we were concerned about hypercoagulability. But be that as it may, um, we had pretty good outcomes. It really did reduce the bleeding, and interestingly enough, we still had intracranial hemorrhages, which were devastating ones. So and that was kind of strange to me. Uh, Carly, uh, toward, I'm not sure where you're from Carly, but welcome. I don't remember. I think I've seen you before and, uh, Kay Garcia from Puerto Rico. Hey, how are you, man? It's good to see you. I, I wouldn't mind some rum. Uh, if you could get me some, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, but welcome everyone. Thank you for participating in the program. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions for Vicky? She's the smarter of the two. Uh, we could ask her. Um, for spending time with us here tonight. And Carly, you're from Canada. What part of it? Oh, Canada. I know that song, by the way. I love hockey. But what town from Canada? Ottawa. There you That's the capital. Ottawa. Yeah, I've seen, I've been to Parliament there before and seen the changing of the guard. It's absolutely beautiful. Stunning, stunning place. I love your, I love your country. It's wonderful. Um, it, I don't want to get into this, but your prime minister, eh, we could do without him. But, your country is beautiful. Your people are wonderful. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Vicki, any parting words of advice? No, that was very good. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope I did your lecture justice. Absolutely. This was your topic. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled it across the finish line. Come on. Come on. Thank you for helping me with it. Thank you for participating. Uh, sure thing. All right. So what do we have tomorrow? We have a really neat session. Dr. Patel is going to be using the green screen over there. And he's going to be going over x-rays, TEEs, CTs, and transthoracic echoes, TTEs, and how you can utilize your imaging for cannula placement, cannula position, confirmation, um, understanding what are we looking at with the cardiac silhouette. You know, we have an impella in, but the heart is blowing up. Is the impeller really doing what we wanted it to do? How can you tell what is going on? Is the heart, what is the native cardiac output? Uh, you know, there's a lot of techniques looking at the mitral valve and how that is looking on echo and where the valve leaflets are going down to. Uh, whether they're hitting the septum or not, all of these things, looking at the different views, 
And I think for, for perfusionists and for nurses and for uh, other advanced practice providers, I think that it, critical care nurses specifically, I think it's really beneficial for all of us to really understand it, even at a basic level, we don't have to be experts. I'm no expert on reading that stuff, but you put, put an x-ray in front of me, I can tell you if the cannula is in the right spot or not. Um, I think we should all have that skill and look at an echo. I can tell you if that heart looks like it's gonna wanna come off ECMO or not. Because when I put somebody on ECMO, there's nothing else I like to hear more than this patient looks like they're ready to come off. That's what I want to hear. Uh, especially with VA ECMO. VV ECMO, a little different paradigm, but I still like hearing it when we say, we think we're ready to decannulate because you know it, it, it's a lot of resource consumption when we have patients on ECMO, as I'm sure those of you who do ECMO know already. And, uh, and I want to remind everybody about the ECMO course. If you didn't see it, uh, please go to mediweb.us. Up in the top, click adult ECMO course, and it'll give you all of the information. I think our next course is scheduled for June. Is that right? June, June 27th. June, yes. yes. And here's the and thing. It might be yes. The didactic early. Say that again. So register early. Cause it yeah, might register early. Out. Well, now that's for the full course. The full, if you're going to do the full course, but for the didactic only, yes. if you are a member of perf web, if you have a, a uh, what is it called? A uh, unlimited subscription. Uh, you know, you, the didactic portion. You have to travel here to do the simulation. There's no way around that. It's a it's a simulation course. But the didactic portion of it is part of your unlimited membership uh, within PerfWeb. When we say we're going to do things unlimited, and your membership is is a certain fee for unlimited, it is unlimited. And uh, we're going to keep with what we what we what we do. We're going to keep to our word. Uh, but those who want to just do that course who are not unlimited members, then the course will be a, a reasonably priced, but probably more than an unlimited membership. So you'll have to make the decision what you want to do. A lot of incredibly good information. So mediweb.us, adult ECMO course, give you all the information in the middle of the screen somewhere you can register and uh, get registered for that. And uh, hopefully if you guys, you know, if you could share that with your colleagues, I'd appreciate that if you don't mind, that would be huge. And if you're on our mailing list, we're gonna be sending you a mail or a flyer about this. If you could share that, we would appreciate that. We do the ECMO course by coming here to Houston or we can do the ECMO course virtually for a team, a hospital, and then uh, that's done virtually, and then bring all of the ECMO simulation materials to you and do the ECMO simulation there. Now, there's a minimum number of students. There has to be 12 at least, uh, but we can go up to, I believe, 16 to make sure everyone has an opportunity to touch everything. Uh, but it's a very good, very comprehensive course. If you can share that with folks, for me, I would appreciate it. Also, the app. I joke about it all the time. I got to sell a million of them. We're nowhere close to that. Please buy the app and get your nurses in the ICU to buy the app and get your critical care guys to buy the app or gals. Uh, buy the app, buy the app, buy the app. And it's two different apps because you got a, 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 an IV rate dose calculator, which also has allowable blood loss in it. It's just a really good app. Take Check it out. It's on MediWeb. It's on uh, the... Uh, iTunes store or the, uh, the app store, I'm sorry, Apple app store or Google play store. Okay. We're ending just a touch early. Hope y'all don't mind. We were a little late yesterday, so this makes up for it. We'll see you tomorrow for imaging, imaging, imaging. Thank you all very much. Peace out.